but it doesn't sell off as badly as people think it will, right? So I think we'll probably have a recession at the end of this business cycle. Um, Hello, everyone. Today, our special guest, Benjamin Cowan, discusses the SOM rule to determine the recession. If you're as excited about exploring the fascinating world of cryptocurrencies as we are, hit that subscribe button now. Don't miss out on our insightful discussions, market updates, and game-changing insights that could potentially shape your financial future. Remember to give us a thumbs up if you find our content valuable. Your support fuels our passion to keep delivering top-notch videos. And hey, why not spread the knowledge? Share our videos with your crypto-curious friends, family, and fellow enthusiasts. If you think this is the first time I've ever spoken about this indicator, that's actually not true. We spoke about this indicator, I believe, almost a year ago. And we noted back then that it was nowhere close to, you know, to, to, to triggering that, that, that threshold, right? At the time, it was only 0.03%. 0.03%. Today, it is at 0.33%, but the trigger will not happen until it reaches 0.5%. Now, where are these percentages coming from? The rule states that if the three-month moving average of the unemployment rate increases by 0.5 percentage points or more above its low for the previous year, <coughs> it is considered a recession signal. This indicator is considered simple and quick to use and has been shown to be a reliable indicator of recessions in the past. Now, we're going to figure out whether that's true or not, right? <laughs> so let's go take a look at the last several recessions and see what happened once this indicator triggered, okay? So we'll first go back to, to 2020. You can see that it triggered, but in this case, when the trigger occurred, the market had already bottomed, right? But when it was at around 0.27%, from the, from the mark of 0.27 to 4%, which is a huge move in a single month, that's, that's where the S&P 500 capitulated, okay? If you go back to more typical recessions, right, where they're, they're longer, they take years to play out, go back and look at the financial crisis. Once, and by the way, this gray line here that you see going across the page, that is the 0.5% threshold. So you can see it triggered here in February of 2008. And of course, you can see what happened to the S&P 500 after it. Nothing good occurred in the S&P 500 after, it, after that, basically for the next year. The market just went down for essentially a year straight uh, with, with occasional rallies, right, just to keep you interested. But it triggered in February, the recession was eventually backdated to December, right, to December. But it, again, it triggered in February, backdate to December, and then it lasted until June of 2009, okay? So in this case, it would have been a good signal, right? I mean, had you waited for this to signal, you would have missed the top, right? But even, you know, even getting out, or taking some profits, even at just off the highs, you would have avoided a majority of the downside. Okay, now let's go look at the dot-com crash. Where did it signal? It signaled in June of 2001. The recession started in March, right? So again, it, it tends to be good to within about a three-month window or so. Now what happened after it triggered in June? The market had actually topped one month earlier. Okay, and that was just a lower high. It wasn't even sort of the cycle high. It was just a lower high. And after that, starting from, you know, starting from June 2001, when it triggered, the market did not even bottom until October 2002. So again, we had another full year where the market went down. So those were the last two major recessions that we've had where the SOM rule worked out pretty well, right? Like had you just waited for it to trigger and and then adjusted your strategy, it would not have been the worst strategy to go with. My expectation for what it's worth, I think we will likely have a recession. 
Uh, if we don't, I would expect it to be a recession scare, kind of like 2016, where you come close to one and the market still sells off to some degree, but it doesn't sell off as badly as people think it will, right? So I think we'll probably have a recession at the end of this business cycle. Um, but again, how long that takes, that's that's really anyone's guess. I mean, at this point, it, it I mean, it's, the economy has been holding on for, for a long time so far. So we've, we've sort of covered the last three. Now let's go back and look at, at, at the, the late 80s. Because here you can see the recession, the sum rule recession indicator triggered in October of 1990. And then the market bottomed basically right after it. Almost in that month, it bottomed. Also keep in mind, though, that the S&P, right, you can see here, in July of 1990 had a pretty sizable correction, right? Let's go let's go figure out exactly what that correction was uh, just so we just so we have it um, on hand. Okay, so this is it right here. This is the correction that the S&P 500 had. You can see that it started here in July of 1990. And the S&P ended up dropping about 20%, about a 20% drop. And, you know, July was red, August was red, September was red, and October was red. So you essentially had four red months in a row and you had a recession, right? And even though, I mean, even though the market bottomed out in October, it didn't really go, it, I mean, it didn't really take out these prior highs until February of 91, right? So it wasn't until the following year that it took out those highs. But again, this is an example where the SOM rule triggered recession warning in October, and then the recession ended up being backdated to July. So again, within about a three-month window, it was fairly accurate in predicting the onset of recession. But in this case, it was not as successful in helping to identify <clears throat> you know, mar you know, market activity over the next year. If you had sold in October of 1990 when this signaled and waited a year, right, and you got in in October of 91, the price would have actually been slightly higher. Not much higher from where you would have sold at, um, but a little bit higher, right? I mean, you're talking about a move from, you know, 314 up to up to 386, right? So it's a, it's a somewhat significant move. So it shows you there's not, even with these indicators that have a pretty good track record of predicting when the onset of a recession occurs, it's still hard to say if following that strategy is always going to work out. And, and you know, the early 1990s is a great example of that. Now we can go back and, and look at, at these other cycles. Um, perhaps let's just go in order starting in, in 1970. The SOM rule recession indicator triggered in March. Looks like it triggered in, in March of 1970. And the S&P then dropped from around 88 down to around 69. Okay, so a somewhat sizable correction by the S&P after the SOM rule recession indicator triggered. And <coughs> once it triggered in February, or sorry, in yeah, in, in, in March, the recession eventually was backdated, it looks like, to December. So again, about a three-month window from where the recession started. Then if you look at 1973, 1974, you will see the SOM rule recession indicator triggered here in July. The recession, the recession after it triggered in July, the recession was eventually backdated to November. So that ended up being backdated by about half a year, okay? Now, after it triggered, the market still sold off, right? So you have an example in, in, in 1970 where the market sold off after it triggered, an example in 1974 where the market sold off after it triggered, and then let's go look at the 80s. Here's an example where it triggered in February. The recession was backdated to January. So within that three-month window, and what ended up happening is after it triggered, the market went slightly up 
to about 118 and then dropped a good amount, right? I mean, it dropped, you know, somewhat considerably down to about less than 100, right? So you're talking about a 20% drop after, after that trigger occurred. And then finally, you had one other trigger here. We had two recessions in the early 80s, sort of back to back. You had it trigger in November of 1981. And we're going to have to zoom. We're going to have to fix this and sort of zoom in here, right? So it triggered here in November of 1981. The market, the S&P at the time was at around 121. And over the next year, it sort of made its way down to about 100. So again, about a 20% drop after the trigger occurred. Okay, so... Out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight recessions, seven of them, it you know, selling, maybe I shouldn't say it like that, right? Seven of them, the market went down significantly after it triggered. <laughs> but one of them did not, and that was in, in the 1990s. Again, it hasn't even triggered yet, right? It hasn't even triggered yet. Now, we could perhaps go look at, there's four other examples. So just for the sake of completeness, we will go through them. I, I don't really want to leave any stone unturned over here. So this first one over here, you know, we really don't have enough data for because, I mean, it, it, you know, the recession was already sort of ongoing um, when we even had this. Uh, and you can see that the market did eventually fall. So, I mean, it seems like it probably would have worked out. Uh, if you go look at the next three recessions, Here's an example, and I was looking at this one before I made this video, and it was one of the reasons why I made the video, because this shows you a completely different outcome, where it triggered in 1953, and then the market just went up, right? The market just went up. It then triggered as well here in 1957. The market dropped a little bit, right? A little bit, hung out at those lows for a few months, and then went up. In this case, in, in, in this last case, it triggered in November. The recession was backdated to June. So within a few months here, it triggered in October. The recession was backdated to August. So again, within that three-month window. And then finally, here, you can see that it, 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 it got a false trigger, right? I mean, it went above it, but it didn't really mean recession immediately. We actually came back down for a few months, and then it went up. And then after it triggered, again the market went slightly lower, and then it just went up, right? So what does this tell us? It tells us that there is no sure thing with this stuff, right? I can look at this, I can look at this, and I can pick out, and there, a majority of these cases, a majority of the cases, the market went down after it triggered, right? We had a you know pretty bad recession in, in a lot of these cases. But there are some cases, like 1990, and like in the in the 50s, where it it did not provide as much of a of 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 a, of a useful tool in terms of navigating the markets. Now, it has generally been a great a, a, a great tool for identifying if you're in a recession, right? In almost all of these cases, you know, except for that one that we just looked at right here. And again, a, a recession eventually came, right? Just a few months later. But generally speaking, when it triggers it means there's a recession, right? As you can see, right? If it triggers, if we go above that 0.5% level, it has historically meant recession. Now, some of the times the market sold off a lot over the following year, and then other times it didn't. So again, <laughs> this is why investing uh, is macro, macro investing is, is very difficult because you can find something that might work 70 or 80% of the time, but it doesn't mean that it's going to work every time, right? And so building out a strategy around that could work and is likely to work, but there's an example, there's, there's reasons why it might not. And that's why hedging is always a good, a good thing to do. I mean, if anything that I've learned over the last several years of investing, hedging is always a great thing to do. Thank you for watching the interview highlights of Ben Cowan. If you enjoy this highlight video, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you.